Uh, Sammy Abdul Aziz is here with us today. He's a public educator and spiritual peacemaker. He is the founder of Common Ground Institute and Services, an Islamic consulting firm dedicated to educating the public on Islam and collaboration for peace. He also serves as a chaplain for Wesleyan University, as well as imam for Bloomfield Muslim Community Center. In the virtual world, he's the imam for PrayerSpark.com, a global interfaith prayer service, as well as the founder and ma maintainer of many websites and Facebook pages, including Philly Muslims, where I'm from, <laughs> Connecticut Muslims, Lighthouse for Humanity, to name a few. In his capacity as imam, he represents the Muslim community at the Bloomfield Interfaith Association and the Interfaith Refugee Resettlement Committee, of which he is a founding member. He is a graduate of the Master's in Islamic Chaplain Chaplaincy, Chaplain, I'm going to spell it wrong, program at Hartford Seminary. So without further ado, I'm proud to introduce Sammy Aziz. Thank you. Sammy, you're set, right? Mm -hmm. I'll lay this over here. Can everybody hear me? All right. Okay. So uh, my name is Imam Sammy Aziz, and I'm going to be talking about Islamophobia. How many of you have heard of the term Islamophobia? Okay, pretty good. Okay, good. So Islamophobia is a recent word in America, uh, first introduced as a concept in a 1991 Runnymede Trust Report and defined as unfounded hostility towards Muslims, and therefore fear or dislike of all or most Muslims. The report pointed to prevailing attitudes that incorporate the following beliefs. Islam is monolithic and cannot adopt to new realities. Meaning that Islam is one, all Muslims are the same, they all worship and uh, believe the same things. Uh, it is true that all Muslims believe in one God, but as far as how they practice their religion, it's different. There's 50 majority Muslim countries, and each country has a different practice of Islam, depending on the culture, the, the rulers of the country, the scholars of the country, and, and many other factors. Um, Islam does not share common values with other major faiths. Completely false. Islam shares uh, values with every faith in the world. Muslim scholars would argue that Islam is closer to Judaism and Christianity than they are to each other. And one of the reasons they give is that uh, Islam is the only religion in the world besides Christianity that recognizes and respects and loves Jesus Christ. And we await for his return similar to many Christians. And like Judaism, we are the only religion in the world that believes in one God without any partners. Islam as a religion is inferior to the West. It is archaic, barbaric, and irrational, right? So all of the images that we see of Islam, most of the images, I should say, because recently the images have been getting better, um, are of people doing violent acts, right? So people will ask me the question often, why are Muslims so violent, right? I don't know any violent Muslims, personally. I've never been violent. But the images we see often, right, are of violent people in the name of Islam doing something. Um, and we'll talk about that more. Uh, Islam is a religion of violence and supports terrorism. Islam is a violent political ideology, meaning that Islam is not a religion, it's a violent political ideology. So like other political ideologies that we don't agree with in the West, like communism, Nazism, we must ban it. So that's sort of the, the storyline. And it's coming out of the current administration as well. Many of the advisors uh, believe that Islam is not a religion, but it's actually uh, a violent political ideology. And if any of you have seen V for Vendetta, the movie, which I highly recommend, in the movie, they banned the religion of Islam, which I believe was the United Kingdom in the movie. And one of um, the comedians on TV, he had a secret sort of back room where he kept forbidden things that the government wouldn't let, him, wouldn't let people have. And one of the forbidden things in that room was a Quran, which is the book of the Muslims. And I found that fascinating personally as a Muslim when I was watching that, uh, because I think there is a fear of just not, not just Muslims, or ISIS or Al-Qaeda, but everything related to Muslims. So the Quran is something that's foreign, it's weird. You know, if, if somebody sees you with the Quran, perhaps, for example, if you're going to the airport, many Muslims won't pack a Quran 
because they're just afraid they're going to get stopped and interrogated more for having a Quran. Even though it's not a violent book, it's a beautiful book if you read it. You can find it on Apple Store or Google Play or, or online in many websites, right? And then also there is this fear of Arabic, right? So people have been pulled off of planes uh, for speaking Arabic. So questions to keep in mind, what do people think of when the word terrorist comes to mind, right? What do we think of ourselves, but also our neighbors, our friends, uh, our fellow Americans? What do they think of when the word terrorist comes to mind? I believe it's Muslim because the association has been made so many times that we don't think of a white male, we don't think of a Buddhist, we don't think of a Hindu, we think of specifically a Muslim, even though there are Buddhist killing, and Hindus who are killing, and Christians who are killing, and atheists who are killing. And statistically, statistically, you're more likely to die at the hands of your fellow American than you are a Muslim, right? And statistically, many Muslims are dying overseas and around the world. Actually, the number one victims of terrorism are Muslims. But we don't perceive them as victims, we perceive them as perpetrators of violence. And what do people think of when the word Muslim or Islam comes to mind, right? So the images or, or the, the individuals that we associate with Islam are not Imam Sami Aziz or Aisha next door or Abdullah. We, we associate Islam and Muslims with Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi, right, and Baghdadi, right, these really evil sort of characters who, who, who do evil things in the name of Islam, that is who many Americans think Islam is or are. Is there a fear, ignorance, hate of Muslims on campus among students, faculty, and staff? I think that's a question that every university campus should ask itself and explore. And it's not difficult to explore. It could be as simple as doing a survey on this campus through like a, a Google survey that you email everybody on campus. And it shouldn't be focused just on Muslims. We should ask, how do you feel towards black people? How do you feel towards other oppressed groups? Um, in America and just get the results and once you get the results then you can use those results to make change upon campus. So I highly encourage this campus to do that. So the question I have you know growing up which I always sort of knew the answer to uh, was do Americans really hate Muslims and if you, know, if you look at this graph, negative 10 to positive 10, and I asked the question, and, and we can ask it here and you can blurt out your numbers, you know, what are the perceptions of people uh, in your life or on this campus or in, in your city towards Muslims? If you could put it on a graph, negative 10 being worst, positive 10 being the best. What do you guys think? Positive nine? Okay, wow. That's good. It's the highest I've ever gotten, to be honest. <laughs> three. Positive three. Positive three. Okay. Good. Yeah, I think this is a diverse campus, so I think it's going to be in the positives. But most of the time, I get negative numbers. Um, so Pew Research decided to do a study. They asked Americans, uh, would like to get your feeling toward a number of groups on a feeling thermometer. and you know, it, the, a rating of zero degrees means you feel as cold and negative as possible. A rating of 100 degrees means you feel as warm and positive as possible. So at the top, I'll just go down the list here. Jews uh, are at 63, Catholics at 62, Evangelical Christians at 61, Buddhist 53, Hindus 50, Mormons 48, Atheists 41, and Muslims at 40. So now we have statistical data backing up something that I thought for, for decades myself, uh, which is just cool for me to see because now that the problem has been identified, we can work on it, right? Together we can work on it and make this numbers different for all religious groups, not just Muslims. And then they decided to ask, Pew Research decided to ask Republicans and Democrats their views towards religious groups. And I think Muslims today perceive the Democratic Party to be more welcoming towards Muslims and other minorities. But even among Democrats, we have a very low number. Um, so 
Muslims come out at 47, uh, and then atheists at 46, Mormons at 44. So they're not at the bottom, but they're with the bottom group. And among Republicans, Muslims come out at 33. So there is a significant, uh, significant difference between Democrats and Republicans, how they view Muslims. But it's still negative in both parties. And this is generally how my interactions have been with Democrats, in the sense that they are welcoming, they are open, but they're very ignorant of my faith group, especially white Americans. They're very ignorant of Islam, of Muslims. Um, this organization that I do this under Common Ground Institute, I started it because I received an email from a Christian elder in Connecticut asking about a beheading uh, in Syria. Somebody I was at the, on the Bloomfield Interfaith Association with, right? It's a, it's a funny email or a ridiculous email because it's like me sending him an email and saying, hey, how come this person from your faith group killed another person from your faith group last night in Hartford or in Philadelphia, right? It would be absolutely ridiculous. But for him, you know, he's not able to find the answers on Islam and Muslims. There is no place to get educated. So the best place he thought to get educated was through me. And that sort of propelled me to go out and start speaking about Islam. Because I realized that if this really sweet guy had questions about Islam, what about the rest of my fellow Americans? And the people you see talking about Islam, most of them, like Al Jazeera just did a study after the first Muslim ban, and they found that 95 percent of the people speaking about the Muslim ban were not Muslim, they were white males, right, who are Christian or atheist. So most of the people speaking about my religion are not Muslims, right, and that's something that I hope to fix through uh, what I'm doing now and through the institute that I have, Common Ground Institute. So how big is Islamophobia? Uh, a 2015 report finds that 55% of Muslim students have been subject to at least one form of religion-based bullying. This is twice as high as the national average of students reported being bullied at school. The findings are based on a statewide survey of over 600 Muslim students ages 11 to 18, right? So I faced this when I was in school. The day of 9-11, there was a kid on the bus. He said we should nuke them all, right? And nobody challenged him. Nobody said that's a wrong statement. Um, and then throughout my life, I've seen it. And it's very easy because nobody's really pushed back against it. And it's something the black people faced in the past, but people push back, and now it's not right anymore, right? And it happened to the Irish, it happened to the Italians, happened to many groups. I think now we're at the Muslims, and people will say things like Osama, right, as an offensive sort of, you know, uh, uh, put down, or terrorist, or raghead. There's, there's many names out there that are used uh, and they haven't been identified or spoken about. And I think this is the time to start speaking about it on our university campuses, at our schools across America. Over $100 million spent between 2008 and 2011. And so oh, at this point, it's probably close to $200 million. That's the number I've been hearing. Bashing Muslims through publication of books, articles, speeches, and videos. Uh, and these books I found all over Connecticut in public libraries and university libraries, and they're put on the shelf with Islam books. I don't think we should censor books, but I think they should be identified in a different category, like anti-Muslim books or Islamophobic books. Uh, and that's something I'm advocating at Wesleyan University, and maybe that's something you could do for your local public library uh, or this campus. So if you go to... Um, uh, Islamophobia.org, you will see a list of individuals who write articles, books, um, and make videos, and, uh, and the books, so I should make a list. I should make a list, because what, what you have to do then is you have to look at the list on the shelf and see do any of those names match Islamophobia.org. It could be a tedious task. Now that you've actually proposed this idea, I think I'll go ahead and do it, because I know all the authors and I know the people who are doing this. So I'll make a list and put it up. But if you go to Islamophobia.org, you will see a, a list of individuals who, who live their lives just to bash Islam. And they get paid to do it, right? One of them was just at Fairfield University. She got paid $15,000 for a one hour speech about Islam, right? And she's not even Muslim. She's not, she's not even Muslim. Um, what's that? What did she say? I, I, didn't want, I didn't go to the speech. You had to pay, you had to pay a ticket price to go. 
yeah, yeah. But, th but the point is, she was asking me what did she say, I didn't go to the speech. But the point is that there are people like this, they get into you know, police trainings, they get into hospitals, they get into universities, they call themselves so-called Muslim experts, and because the American public doesn't know how to check them, right, they get into these places, then they do trainings. So we have an organization called CARE, or CARE.com, Council on American Islamic Relations. They are effectively the ACLU of the Muslim community, or the NAACP. And they go out and challenge whenever these people come out, they spew hate, they get into a university campus, uh, a, a politician says something against Muslims, somebody gets fired for being Muslim, which has happened multiple times across America at different organizations and, and companies. So this organization will defend us uh, in, in those cases. Islamophobianetwork.com. We're going to see a video from them in the next slide. And they also have been writing reports about Islamophobia. And then Southern Poverty Law Center, they're quite famous in America. They track all sorts of hate against all people, including black people and other minorities. Um, and they do an excellent job of it, tracking them, identifying them, labeling them, you know, exposing them, et cetera. And then ACLU has done lawsuits against uh, Islamophobia. So I'm going to show you a, a quick video on this topic. In America today, there is a well-funded force aimed at vilifying Islam and Muslim Americans for political gain. It's a fairly small core network of funders, advocates, and, and scholars who are pushing these ideas and continue to push them. This is how the Islamophobia network operates. A group of foundations and donors provides the money. To date, more than $57 million. That money is given to a selection of tightly knit organizations that rely heavily on a handful of so-called experts that orchestrate misinformation about Islam. That misinformation then spreads through a larger network of activists, politicians, media, and more, creating an echo chamber around the false idea that Islam is a violent religion. And I think defining Islam writ large as a threat, as many in the Islamophobia network do, will, is simply wrong and will lead to bad policy. The Islamophobia network has real consequences for Muslim Americans. There's been a nationwide push for laws targeting Muslims. In New York City, the NYPD conducted a spying program that covertly monitored and mapped the city's Muslim communities. And in Boston, a Muslim doctor was assaulted after the Boston Marathon bombings. This interactive tells these stories, but also focuses on the people who came together to fight against the Islamophobia network. I think this is a very basic American civil rights religious freedom issue. I mean, this is one of the core beliefs of all Americans, progressives and conservatives, is the right to practice your religion. Explore the Islamophobia network or view the stories about its consequences. So the Islamophobia network that you just saw in this video and the previous slide is not new. It's been there for decades. Um, we, know, we have known the players. The Muslim community has seen the hate for decades. And what we see now on the national level is just a production or a final product, you can say, of years of hate that's sort of been festering underneath and nobody's challenged it. So under the Obama administration, for example, these people were there and Islamophobic things were done. But because we didn't have the, I would say, the zeal that we have right now as a community to push back against hate, people were generally oblivious or not caring about it. But now I find because of the election and the way things went, that I, I have so many allies in the community. So I see that as a silver lining, and I think it's a really good thing in a sense, because it's, I think it's better when hate is out there in the open, and then we can challenge that hate. Right, versus it being underneath and everybody's just like, oh, everything is cool, we got a black president, he's got kind of a Muslim sounding name, and everything is cool, right? But in reality, Muslims were boycotting Obama's iftar dinners in Ramadan because they didn't like some of his policies. They're, I mean, they were Islamophobic. He was bombing a lot of Muslim countries, he kept the prison, Guantanamo, and there were some other, other issues. Uh, and we'll take questions at the end, if that's okay, yeah. Um, so after, one week after the election, there was 111 anti-Muslim bias incidents, and across the nation, by every single report, whether it's the FBI statistics on crime, whether it's the ACLU, whether it's Council on American Islamic Relations, or the NAACP, hate has gone up against every single minority group in this country, by a lot. Not a little bit by a lot, it's jumped. Because whenever you have a national politician make spew hate from his, from his pedestal, people listen to it and then they act upon it. Uh, this sent a, a, a 
this caused me a, a lot of fear and a lot of fear in the Muslim community. Uh, back in 2015, when 30 governors signed executive orders banning refugees from their states, because in effectively what they were saying to me was that they don't want Muslims in their states. Because what they were really scared of was Syrian refugees and Iraqi refugees. And one case in particular that I remember when a plane was supposed to land in Ohio, but it was diverted to Connecticut because they had signed an executive order. So the question is, are refugees dangerous? And really, it's, it's linked to are Muslims dangerous? That's really the bottom line. That's what I see when people ask this question. Uh, according to the Cato Institute, of the 859,000 refugees admitted from 2001 onwards, only three have been convicted of planning terrorist attacks on targets outside of the United States, and none was successfully carried out. And none of the perpetrators of the major US attacks carried out in the name of Islam in the past 15 years have come from the seven nation on Trump's ban list. So has anybody heard of the anti-Sharia bill? No? Okay. okay. So this might be interesting. <laughs> Since 2007, so-called anti-foreign law bills have been popping up in state legislatures across the country. The bills seek to ban Sharia law, an Islamic moral and judicial code. Eight states have passed the law. Yet no lawmaker has ever introduced a bill proposing a political system based on Sharia law. The purpose behind these bills is clear, to smear Islam and Muslims in America for political gain. They would say we're trying to protect American values, which in their case are decidedly Christian values. I mean, this is a country that truly believes in freedom of religion, and this was an impact on, on that. Almost all of the legislation is based on a model bill written by David Earl Shami, an attorney working with many of the activists in the Islamophobia network. His draft legislation is fueled by the false belief that Muslims are trying to supplant America's constitutional republic through Islam. But it just goes to show that when you're very well funded, you know, you can get these things in, into the media bloodstream and get people talking about them. In 2011, the Islamophobia Network looked to Michigan as its next target. But when state representative David Ajima introduced anti-Sharia legislation, something unexpected happened. A diverse coalition of colleagues came together to fight it. During the initial introduction of the bill, Ajima was able to get a large amount of co-sponsors for the bill, predominantly from the Republican Party. <laughs> First of all, I want you to know that it bothers me that I even have to stand here and talk about this issue. When you enter a court of law, I do not want your rights, as we understand them according to the Constitution, either state or federal, to be abridged by any foreign law. Is that too much to ask? No. I don't think it is. So, of course, on the surface, it sounds good even though uh, the United States Constitution uh, and the Supremacy Clause, there is no foreign law that can trump American law uh, to begin with, and that was something that was enshrined in our Constitution by uh, the authors uh, uh, of that document to begin with, and the Supreme Court has, of course, always traditionally upheld that, so there was no threat. I think more and more people understood that uh, this Foreign Law Act uh, impacted all faiths, and that it was a slippery slope. While the law was aimed at Islam, there was a real possibility that it could affect other religions too. That brought outspoken opposition from leaders of other faiths calling it an attack on religious liberty. I coordinate with Rashida a press conference in which we called for some of our allies, including the NAACP and the ACLU, where we called out Dave Edgema and his true agenda behind the anti-Sharia bill. I'm lucky in that I was there, you know. There was a Muslim legislator there while it's happening, and I was very passionate about it. It's hard when somebody that's not of that faith, from that community, that's not there in the caucus room, understanding the legislative process, knows the players involved, has access to them. It's very, very difficult. The actual introduction of itself and the talking points that went along with it were clearly designed to marginalize Muslims uh, in the state of Michigan from being accepted fully into the uh, social political process. Why would anybody think that Sharia law is going to take over the country? We have a constitution and our constitution protects us from foreign laws being ruled on as legal laws in this country. It has to be a United States law for it to be applicable in the courts. 
Are there further amendments? There being no further amendments, question for the House is a means bill to respect. One of my first questions was show me the proof. Why do we need this? Where does it help? And the, then the folks, the members that were supportive of the bill, could not produce anything that, at least in my personal opinion, would justify a vote on the bill. So Ajima didn't take no for an answer and decided to ignore Representative John Walsh's request for more factual evidence to show that there is a great need for his Foreign Law Act. But he was aggressive about it. He wouldn't stop. Uh, every time I turned around, he got up to the mic. I was like, oh my God, again? People can take up this issue, and even if they're not able to forward, say, uh, anti-Sharia legislation as Ajima failed to do in, in Michigan, it's a way of, of kind of setting yourself up and making yourself attractive to the sorts of funders um, who can help support um, a political campaign. It's hate. Pure and simple, it's hatred. And it's anti-Semitism at its worst. We've seen a rise in anti-Semitism, whether it's against Muslims or Jews. And I think that we are a multicultural nation. We have been built on pluralism. Um, we are a stronger nation because of our differences and because of our acceptance of those differences. And so I think we just keep celebrating our ethnic diversity and our religious diversity. And hopefully we grow into a stronger nation because of it. Working in the legislature post 9-11, uh, that every time 9-11 happens, during, sitting in that ceremony, I kept thinking to myself, you know, everything that happened, I know that I've changed the mindset of so many of my colleagues. I mean, I have 109 colleagues that probably would have never met a Muslim or worked with one, but for the fact that I got elected to the legislature. I mean, nobody could have ever imagined my, my mother who's pregnant with me on an airplane from Palestine comes here and like 30 something years later, her daughter becomes the first Muslim woman ever elected. And she didn't speak English when she started school. I mean, that, that dream and that opportunity, I want that to be accessible to all the families in the city of Detroit. And I want to continue fighting for that and preserving that. And that includes fighting back any anti-American legislation like the Foreign Law Act or anything like that that happens in the legislature. Just last week, I saw on Facebook that another uh, representative proposed an anti-Sharia bill in Michigan. So this is something that continues to be put out there. I know, you know, after the election, a lot of people were saying, you know, we would register if Muslims got registered. I'm fairly certain I'm already registered on some list or multiple list. Uh, there is, for example, the no-fly list, which nobody knows if they're on it. 100,000 people are on it. They can't challenge it. Uh, and there's other lists out there, I'm sure, as well. I think more of a concern are laws like this passing, uh, including a law that was proposed by Ted Cruz or was written by Ted Cruz to ban the Muslim Brotherhood, which would effectively shut down every Muslim organization in America because many of them have their roots or were started by members of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a civic and social organization across the Middle East, uh, which has usually challenge dictators that are supported by America. So I think that's partially the reason why they want to ban this organization. Um, so why should I be worried about Islamophobia? Why should we all be worried? The fear of Muslims is being used to make poor decisions by our politicians for all Americans. For example, uh, invasion and bombing of Muslim countries, many Muslim countries, which causes Americans, American untold lives and our tax money, uh, up to $2 trillion in Iraq, Afghanistan, or, or more. Uh, Anti-Sharia bill proposed in all 50 states and passed in nine states. NYPD unwarranted spying of Muslims. So the NYPD was, was sort of caught spying on the Muslim community three different times and rebuked by a federal judge three different times uh, who had to appoint uh, a, 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 an oversight, a civilian oversight, to make sure they don't continue to do it. Um, FBI unwarranted spying of Muslims. So there's reports that Muslims, uh, that FBI agents will pretend to be Muslim, infiltrate into Muslim communities, go into mosques, spy. Um, 
more restrictive laws passed against all Americans in the name of national security, the arming of our police departments with military guns, weapons, and vehicles, uh, untold trillions spent on fear, uh, hate which leads to poor choices by people in our society against Muslims and all people. And so this is an arson that happened this year. There's been five mosques burned this year. Um, and this is, a, I guess, a positive result where many of the neighbors came out to support the Muslim community, uh, to raise money for them as well. So how many Americans are killed by Muslims? In 2015, there were at least 355 mass shooting incidents in the United States. Only three of these, or 0.008%, were perpetrated by Muslims. Statistically, the chances of an American being killed in a terrorist attack by someone claiming that Islam sanctions their actions is one in 20 million are markedly lower than the chances of being killed by a dog, one in 116,448. The fear of Muslims or the linkage of the word terrorism to Muslims is uncalled for and an exaggeration. So that's my uh, email address, my phone number, my website. Um, if you guys are interested in interning, in volunteering and helping out in any way. We're looking for interns with all sorts of skills. Uh, we continue to go around New England and give talks on Islam, ISIS, Islamophobia. If you have locations for me to go to, churches, libraries, schools, any institution where I can get in front of people, I'm, I'm willing to go and talk to them. I think the best way to, to break down the fear of Muslims is to meet people. Uh, Pew Research states that 62% of Americans have never met a Muslim. And I imagine even the other 38% who have met a Muslim, it probably, they probably didn't have conversations about the faith. It was probably a, a, a coworker, a schoolmate. So I think it's important for me and other Muslims to get in front of, in front of people, in front of Americans, and explain their faith and show the commonalities. 